Put your hands together, folks. For Pesh! Morby, nice to see you, my friend. Welcome in. Glad you could make it. Nice to see you. Pat, thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, um, I, yeah. po- I apologize for the mess that was that intro, but here we are. We're doing it. We made it happen. No, I, I like the intro. Oh, well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Uh, how you doing, man? How, how was your day? How's, how's things cooking over there in New York City? Awesome. Yeah? It was a great day? Yeah. What, what what do you do? Like, like I, I imagine you as a composer and, it, and, and by the way, I love that you still have your hair and the same hairdo that you had from the eighties, which I mean, it's not the same, but I love that you like keep it like up and like puffed out. I, I absolutely love that. Um, but I, 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 I imagine as a composer who composed, I mean, you've done stuff for like for Dexter New Blood and Rocco's Modern Life and, you know, the list goes on and on. Do you just wake up and start composing? Like, like, what do you like? Do you what's your morning routine like? Do you just wake up and I'm like, I'm writing music. I mean, like, I, 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 what, how do you approach your work on a day to day basis? Well, I mean, if I'm in the Dexter was definitely wake up shine my shoes, pack my lunch <laughs> and get to work <laughs> and punch in. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was intense and fantastic. Same with, you know, a million years ago when I did Rocco's modern life yeah. and I've done a fair amount of, you know, TV stuff and it, it's like being in, in an engine. Mm. It, it's, it's, the schedule is pretty crazy. Uh, but you know, I do like to get up and say, yeah, I'm composing today. I like to work every day. Yeah. I like, yeah, yeah. I like to do that. I like to get up. I I live, uh, you know, I like my neighborhood a lot. My, I have a studio about five blocks away. So I grab a cup, go stroll over and do it. And sometimes it's, some days it's more fun than others, but I like what I do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no. Uh, on those bad days, even on your worst days as a composer, it's still better than working in a cubicle, wouldn't you say? Uh, I wouldn't know. I've never, I've never worked in a cubicle. You, you, uh, <laughs> you are a lucky man, sir. You are a lucky man. And nothing against people who work in cubicles. Nothing against that. It's just, uh, cool. man. Uh, uh, it, it's just, it, well, I have worked in a cubicle as someone who has worked in a cubicle and, ha- and has worked as a professional musician, working musician, uh, you know, the cubicles are horrible. And, and I would rather play brown eyed girl until my fingers fell off than to go back to that prison. So whatever, <laughs> I'll play brown eyed girl and get, let's do it again. <laughs> uh, but no, I, mean, I gotta tell you, no doubt about it. I, I'm, I'm really fortunate. And at this point, you know, I've been at it for a minute. So yeah. I'm, I, I'm pretty lucky. Yeah, absolutely, man. So, so are you saying that you've never worked like a, a job job, like a waiter or anything like that? You, you just went from, you know, college straight to music and that was it? Not exactly. I, I went from college to living in Paris. I moved to Paris. Oh. I lived in France. Wow. And Why? Because I had a grant, a research grant, and uh, I didn't know what I was doing, but I gave it a try, and um, I did some cool things in Paris. But like it what? got to the what, point. What were you doing in Paris? Well, my my grant was to investigate American expatriate jazz musicians. So I was going to write like a book, and I interviewed a few, uh, and it and it was. Um, it was daunting, and it was pretty clear that I wasn't going to do that. Um, <laughs> and they, um, You're like, nah, this ain't happening. But like, what was what was like the thesis of the book? Like, it, I, I imagine like expatriates are they just like I'm done with America, so I'm going to Paris to explore the jazz scene over there? Well, to be, I'll be really honest with you. It was different stories. Everybody had different stories. Mm. So maybe somebody was over there because their marriage wasn't working out Mm. or maybe somebody was over there because 
the gigs were better and the yeah. gigs were definitely better and <laughs> yeah. the, for jazz yeah. it's right for particularly for the kind of yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah i mean it was very welcoming on a on a on a high level for for jazz musicians yeah and, and i was moving all sorts of different kinds and then i um and then and then somebody told me that i should meet this composer who i absolutely uh worshipped named john cage oh yeah john cage yeah he's a legend you, you, who, who, yeah john cage wow that's amazing cool so wait wait yeah, you, so you I, did a work I, what'd you do with yeah, him yeah we worked I, I i studied we we worked and we performed in paris like a workshop <laughs> that's so cool and um that was heavy yeah that was a big deal and then i um but wait but what then, were you doing with john like what what kind of why was it so heavy well because he's major yeah <laughs> and um he has incredible conviction hmm. and in terms of working every day this is a guy who does that who hmm. did that on a major level and um you know i won't go into the details but we you know i i we i played a pine cone <laughs> and he was he was um uh, it was it was deep. That's just all I'm going to say about it. And the Fair people, enough. the people in the at the American Center where we did this performance, um, it, they loved it, and for good reason. It was it was awesome, and uh, weird, and uh, but all I really wanted to do was get back to New York, and um, and play either CBGBs or Max's Kansas City. Okay, okay, so some for pretty. Two, Pretty two real clubs. Yeah, that, well, well, and then I ended up doing that. Yeah, you you did that like a, a thousand times over, right? I mean, like you ended up coming back to New York and, and setting it on fire. Uh, that 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 is so cool. You got to experience that. What 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 was some of your takeaways working with John Cage? Like that you've sort of taken from that experience and sort of applied it to your career. Well, first. If you're going to do that kind of thing that he does, mm -hmm. it, but let, first of all, he's the most caring, generous, one of the two most caring, generous musicians I've ever met and, and composers on that. I mean, this is a major level. And I met, um, he had conviction about what he did. Mm -hmm. I mean, he felt it from someplace really soulful. Mm -hmm and powerful and he meant it um this was not playing around hmm. and he had extremely uh impressive work habits hmm. and he talked to me about that he talked to me about discipline yeah and uh so you know i hate to be a downer but you know this is and he didn't it wasn't like a lecture as a matter of fact all he said was one sentence he put his hand on my shoulder and he said uh let's talk about discipline <laughs> and, and that's all it took <laughs> oh oh sorry mr john cage okay <laughs> yeah. i don't remember what i said but i but i remember that what yeah. he said Did, and uh, do you think that he so, thought that you lacked discipline well i know that he did ah Okay. But I won't go into the details. No worries. No worries. It's all good. It's all good. No. Uh, uh, yeah, man, that, that's, uh, I think that's like a huge part of anything you want to pursue, right? Is, is like, do you have to be disciplined? Even the days that you don't want to do it, you sort of have to get up and go do it. Like you were saying, you got your coffee, you got good days in the studio, you got bad days, but the thing is that you're there, you're doing it and you're, you're, you're putting it out there. Like, uh, I think that's like most of it. I was it Woody Allen said like half of show business is just showing up, just keep showing up or yeah. something. <laughs> like you just if you show up and you you keep working at whatever it is that you find important or wherever you're drawn to, I I, I you will find yourself going somewhere. Uh, but uh, wherever that goes, I don't know. Uh, so you ended up back in New York, and that's when you start getting into the 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 no wave the scene is yeah that well i won't i won't make the i won't i won't pretend that it was a direct line i did work as a waiter oh there you go let's you know, go you know 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, I, 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 not that there was anything wrong with somebody just being a musician from like the time. Cause I, I have lots of friends who just grew up in a musical family. They played drums when they were with their parents, when they were, you know, eight and nine and just grew up and now they're professional gigging musicians. And that's all they know. That's just all they knew. It was just, that's all they had. So it, it's, uh, it, it is to me, I, I find that uh, there is something humbling about having to take that step, that that one step of, of having to work a job that you don't particularly care about in order to sort of survive, especially in a city like New York City, which at the time when you're in New York City seems like it was a little bit more uh, livable for a, a uh, aspiring musician to get by. Whereas now I couldn't imagine being like a working musician, just trying to make it in New York, you know, like I don't well, I'll, I'll make it anywhere. Yeah. This, this job was particularly cool because the guy who ran the restaurant, he knew what I, he knew what he was getting and yeah. that he hired people, actors and, hmm. and people, musicians. And, and we could show up at like, we could show up at 10 and get breakfast. Oh, <laughs> you know so it was that kind of deal and then That's we would awesome. do our thing and at the for lunch and then we could grab another bite yeah that's and so then you you could then you could make it up and make it in time to for happy hour down at the uh at the bar yeah and hang and or rehearse or play whatever you know and then the next day was the same deal it was yeah i was i was very fortunate to have that job yeah those those jobs are so super important to musicians who are like flexible that feed you <laughs> yeah. yeah those i mean i remember in the beginning and when i first started being you know just working whatever gigs and they were like we got free beer for you i was like heck yeah i'll, I'll play for free beer or free food like i'm here for it you know at the beginning now it's like we can feed you it's like i'm not I have food in my fridge. I need that money. I don't, I can't, I don't need your food. <laughs> Movie Dutchman. Yeah. What's up, buddy? Uh, but uh, yeah, that, that, uh, in any case, that's awesome. Uh, so would you say that was probably your only venture into like a, a job, job like that? Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hey man, it, musician life is like you hit rough times in certain parts of your life, so you know. No, 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 no. I was I was pretty fortunate to be able yeah. to to be a working musician pretty quick. Yeah. But I did. I was working for a very cool uh, uh, record distributor. Mm. I drove a truck, but I hit a bus. <laughs> I, I was driving, Sorry. and I and I, I all it took was I hit the bus, and it was like I'm out. <laughs> I'm done. Yeah, it, it, it's funny. It to me, it's funny to see like artists who are like are just meant to be artists try to like do other things, and it's just like they. I think I feel like they get mislabeled a lot as like lazy or um, unambitious, and it's really I think it's just because they're not challenged and they're not putting together these like musical puzzles that they're constantly trying to assemble. Would you agree with that? Well, absolutely. I mean, let's take, uh, look, let's just take the B-52s. Sure. You know, you're not going to be on that level and be lazy. <laughs> right. These guys work hard. Yeah. Or, you know, like on the road. Our first tour was 18 months long. And, you know, it's, there were some breaks in there, but you know, people say, people will ask, oh, God, you wild parties. Oh, well, no, actually, you know, like when you have to drive from Detroit to San Francisco overnight. Yeah, we have some more great times. I mean, and great parties. Right. They're, it was fun. But they and you they work hard. Yeah, they work really hard. And that's kind of what John Cage was saying. Mm -hmm. You know, I think he knew that. I really wanted to do this. I don't think he knew or cared what I did really, but he just knew. And it was the first time I, I, I mean, it was the most incredible direction I've ever had. Yeah. You know, like, Hey, listen, it's the same as if you're, you know, going to play the deck on the soundtrack for Dexter or, or whatever. It's like you hit it and quit it. You, you've got to play the thing, you write it, you got to play it. You, you don't, you don't, you don't have, 
time to like ponder. Yeah. Oh, oh, this is, you know, oh, I'm, 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 I love every, you know, this is, this is, a, this is like deadlines. Yeah. Rocco's Modern Life. You know, I was not going to be the reason that show did not make it on the air. Right. You know, right. it was, and so that got, that was a, that was a motivator. Yeah. And uh, I'll get this done. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's cool you know it's yeah. cool you know like it's not a cubicle no it's not um so, but but getting those puzzles done no the the, the I, I keep calling them puzzles because in, in moments like that where you have a deadline and you i've had this moment before where it's like and i kind of found a workaround which is like i'll get to a moment where it's just like okay what do i do here i don't know oh my god what am i gonna do um, and then I will just, I would sit there and like, oh my God, how am I going to do this? Like, I would just stop in my tracks. And then what I've found that I could do is either I'll go and work on other parts of the song that needs more work and then I'll come back to it. Or it'll be, I will take the simplest, most basic <laughs> route possible forward just to go forward because really I'm right. just hitting, trying to hit that finish line and you can always go back and do stuff. But the thing is that like, I just need to get to that finish line and then I have a full thing I can sort of look at because that's how my stupid brain works. I have to see it all <sighs> anyways, but, but I, I don't know, like what are, when you have those moments, you have a deadline and you hit a block, what are some of the things you sort of do to move past those moments? Uh, panic. <laughs> it's good to hear you say that, honestly. <laughs> Not that I want you to be in a panic mode all the time, but, you know, it's nice to know that people who are working on the top echelons of this business are still sitting there like, oh, my God. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, well, the first time, my first real steady experience working on a, on a, on a series, and one of the most thrilling one was Rocco's Modern Life. That's interesting. Cartoon. That's interesting. And, I, and, by the way, I gotta say, I that was like one of my favorite cartoons growing up. So I'm just saying that's really awesome. <laughs> I love that show. It's a good one, right? Oh, yeah, I loved it so much. Really yeah, I do too. And it continues to be. Yeah. I mean, you know, come on. I get to. I get to. It's cool for me. Absolutely. You, you've heard of it. It's oh, really yeah. cool. Oh well, that's it's cool. That's, I'm cool. glad. That, I mean, oh, yeah, it's a big deal. Well, it's a it was like right in that perfect time because I was a kid come home from school and like Nickelodeon had all those like Rugrats and Rocco's and Doug and like all those were like a cornerstone of my after school routine. So I come mm -hmm. home and eat like a pack of hot dogs in front of the TV and, <laughs> and tell of my dad got up. So it was just that, you know, it was one of the it was basically my babysit. Pat, you were basically in some weird cosmic way my babysitter. So <laughs> thank you, Pat. I appreciate yeah. all the hard work you put into raising me. It, it, it was it's well. I mean, it I, a lot. you know, like when I I, I had a uh, my son was uh, probably a, a little bit younger than you, but basically was in the same area, and I got to go to the dad's go to school for what are your for work day? Yeah, or yeah. And I remember one of the kids, he just like, he just looked at me so serious and he scrunched up his face and he goes, do you know Rocco? <laughs> so listen, <laughs> I mean, how cool is that? That is really cool. I mean, I mean, I mean, but, but, but really did, did you know Rocco? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, good, good. Well, I mean, you had to have, right? Like, you, you, I mean, you had, because you are also laying emotional uh, foundations for that character as well, because the music has so much to do with, with a, 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 with a show or a movie or anything, you know? So, in a way, you know, like, you did know Rocco, like, pretty intimately, uh, especially to be able to compose stuff around his feelings, around what he's doing, around what the environment is. So, I mean, in a way, I mean, I mean, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Yeah, it is. It are, is beautiful. Are, he and his buddies, the turtle and the heifer. Heifer! Oh, my God. Heifer. I forgot about these. Man, see, I, 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 I should I forget about heifer. Uh, you know, and so I... I 
first it was like chaos. Mm. I, I couldn't wait to do it. But uh, we had an amazing band. Mm. I mean, amazing band. Like do that stuff. We were live. And I it was one of the, it was it was what I thought making records was going to be like. Mm. And I mean, I'm still in touch with everyone that was playing on that. Um, I got I brought everyone back for the movie that you mentioned that came or no, somebody else mentioned it, it came out a couple of years ago. And um, man, we had a ball. Yeah. And it was chaos. It was just chaos. The the vibe of the 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 director almost wanted it. I don't know whether I said it or he whoever said it. It was like, you know, like a glass of water that's overflowing all the time. Yeah. You know, he wanted, he wanted overload. <laughs> Uh, he wanted chaos. Yeah. And it was, I said, I'm your man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here for a baby. Let's go. Heck yeah. yeah. And, and, and I got to sort of combine a couple different without really thinking about it. I had it thinking about it ahead of time. I, I, I just combined who I was, which was Iggy and the Stooges jazz, you know, punk rock, out jet art ensemble of Chicago or Ornette Coleman or Raymond Scott from the original Warner brothers cartoons. Um, whom I, which I love I, to this day. And, um, uh, and I just would go, let's go. And we would record everything and, and then, you know, get it done. It would, you know, whatever we'd run it down the tapes yeah. No, you know, we'd run it down to FedEx. Yeah. FedEx, I loved Rocco. So like he would hear my car coming up into the parking lot. <laughs> they wait for me, get the tape and go onto the truck, wow. fly it out to LA and wow. they'd mix it. Wow. That that that's wild. I mean, and now you just email that, right? Like you're just like I'm like, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now it's all emails, which is somebody will say, and I pretend to like know what I'm doing, and it'll be like just put that on our server and upload and great. I'm, I got it. Yeah. You know, cool. <laughs> and, then, and then, and then your FaceTime and so your, your kids like, okay, how do I do this now? <laughs> um, uh, well, actually no, on, on, on Dexter, we, they were so together uh, uh, with, with, with like spotting sessions hmm. and music critiques uh, going over the scripts and you know we would do zoom calls and i would submit music so we were doing it all remotely and they made it really smooth mm. from the showrunner on down um at the editors from that there were four producers and they really made it work it was a pleasure yeah. it, was, it was tricky yeah but it was cool are you now now you're working these days do you just record everything in your own personal studio and then you send it out to them or do you have to assemble I, i'm sure it, it depends on what the situation is but for the most part are you just working out of your studio and sending out your your you know your tracks or are you um going and traveling to different places and working with bands and you know composing stuff like that this one, well, I have an, uh, a, a guy, that, a friend and a colleague that I work with from to this day who worked with me on Rocco. And I'm going to, his name is Patrick Deravaz. And he's, he's, if I were to say he's my engineer, it just wouldn't capture what he does f f for me. So he, he, I will record the tracks on Dexter, and there was some guitar and some analog synth recording. And then I send it to him to mix. And he mixes everything mm -hmm. because I'm starting on the next ep next episode. And um, this one, this one was tricky. I didn't get everything the first time. You know, I had a, f a fair amount of revisions to do. It wasn't bad. It was just I was working on a new show with a long past. Yeah. Um, Dexter was a new show, and I was working with people that had, had been on that show for eight years. Oh, wow. So I they knew they knew what was what the what was happening. And mm. I 
needed to get up to speed. That doesn't even really capture it. It was, but it was um, a new show, and I wanted to get it right. Huh. And so they they work with me, but you know I did I, I you, you know if I if I needed a small ensemble or a small orchestra or whatever I would go to a studio. Okay. And I did that on the show before. Okay. Uh, but right. uh, not this one, not Dexter. Okay. Okay. Yeah, because when I was listening through, it sounds like you did a, like a lot of like pads and analog synth sounds like that and stuff, stuff that you can do in your own. Yeah, because because your studio is probably not big enough to have a big old orchestra in there, and no. <laughs> yeah, right. On. Not, that's why I have the, uh, but but the cosmos um, behind me. But um, it's no, I have a great studio, it, it, but it it you're right. You know, I record, I can record three or four musicians in there at a time. Oh, okay. And I've done that. It's oh. it's nice. It's nice like that, but it's getting a little louder. You know, oh. with the the. the subway and the construction and the, oh, and the sure. stuff <laughs> yeah no, i'm sure your engineer and you and you're the guy who mixes and masters your stuff loves those the take out of the recording when he's going well that's kind of why we work together yeah. i mean i know that he will can do that right, right. and and he, and it's not like oh my god what are you doing to me? I mean, he knows, right. he knows my, my, my stuff. He knows, right. He, you trust him and you guys got a really good relationship and a repertoire and all that good yeah, stuff. Yeah. yeah. That's great. Yeah. You, you, you need somebody that you could trust in this business <laughs> that you can oh, work yeah. with, man. Um, oh yeah. I, I kind of wanted to circle back because I, I, I think we got lost on the panic part, but I, I am really curious on like how, when you hit roadblocks, what are some of your go-tos to, to get past those roadblocks when you need to, like when you have deadlines and such? Well, uh, if, 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 if I were to be really accurate in a way, I would say I can't afford to have roadblocks. Right. <laughs> but um, you know, you got to power through it. But on Dexter, let's say, mm -hmm. I didn't get any real specific direction. I got the scripts, and I so I knew what was happening. And I watched every episode of the original series with oh, a wow. score by Daniel Lick. So I had notes on every one. Nobody, nobody was going to... Of course, it did happen where they referred to something and I didn't know what it was, but mm -hmm. but but I was determined to know if there was ever a reference. Remember when we the Bay Harbor Butcher or whatever, and I could I could I could be there. Mm -hmm. I knew what it was. I could I could find it. Yeah. Wow. But um, uh, I started off and I thought in my mind I knew what 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 we wanted to do. And then I submitted it all, and they were all in very polite ways, finding ways to say, gong, <laughs> you know. And so all that time that we had to um, do some pre-production now is gone. Wow. And I had, uh, I, I now had to really scramble. And um, a couple of the ideas that I had were using guitars where I would just Put, set up the guitars behind me and fill the my studio with the sound of guitars feeding back. Oh, wow. And you can hear and that when you were playing, it's in there. Okay. It's an amazing sound. Um, and Michael C. Hall, who played Dexter, famously played Dexter, po pointed that out to me in the most generous, positive way. Um, you know, there's something in that one, the dissonance and the and the anger, uh, the feeling that uh, we, we we can work with that, and I so I used that, and then and then the other one of the other directors, he was very uh, explicit about wanting an ambient sound. He very clearly said we want it ambient, and I'm a big fan of that music kind of music and. You know, working with John Cage, for instance, yeah. I've got a pretty good idea where this music came from. Yeah. And um, and so, you know, we were talking earlier, I have this band called um, Sus and we uh, record and perform a, a, a ambient 
style of music. And I don't know that if I hadn't had that band for them to refer to, that it would have been as smooth. Mm -hmm. Because if you take the cartoon music, Rocco's Modern Life and B-52s, for instance, that can be a little confusing for somebody who wants to hear like an ambient horror kind of sound. Right, right. Luckily, the showrunner was on my side. I think everybody was on my side. They knew we wanted to make it work. Yeah. Um, but 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 I had Sus, which was closer to the sound that they were imagining. Hmm. That that yeah, and and like right away, like I, I hearing you know, I, I got to listen to a few of the tracks, few tracks by Sus, and like right away, I'm just like, oh yeah, I I can totally hear that this dude's into like scoring uh, movies and stuff, like like right away, like because because ambient music nowadays it feels like you know if people were to listen to it and not really be familiar, it'd be like this sounds like a movie soundtrack, you know what I mean? So it it does sort of do that but you know there's also a, there's way more to it than just you know movie sounds and stuff but still uh it, it's uh it's it, yeah man that I, I yeah the sus thing man i i dig that you're doing that and and do you do you guys play live do you go out and tour i, I we had a question from the chat and they were wondering if you're going to be touring with any projects um so do you guys tour with sus or is this just a you know a studio band how you know well we'd love to tour okay uh but making that work on a touring level is is challenging. Yeah. We played South yeah. by Southwest. Oh, heck yeah. Um, which was cool. Yeah, I love that festival. Yeah. And we just played a really far out club in Bushwick uh, called Rubelod. And um, we're, now we're, we're focusing on, on this next release new record which is coming out um in early november on northern spy and we'll see uh if we can string together some dates but it's really challenging mm -hmm. um, you know um but yeah we'd love i'd love to but we're not we don't have a tour booked what's the challenge of what, what what's the challenge you said it was challenging what's the challenge well, we're we're not a pop group, right? So yeah. we don't have radio play that mm -hmm. you can like tune into and say, um, "This is you know number one on the call of radio." Right. Um, we're not teenagers. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. So um, that's a factor. Yeah, yeah. You got families and lives and deadlines. Well, well, no, that's no, it's not. Yeah, sure. But I mean, I think all of our families would say, yeah, man, go. Oh, yeah. go. But it's more like, you know, the B-52s have 45 years of goodwill built up mm. with fans. And um, Sus is a, basically a new band. Mm. Um, and so, you know, booking dates is, is challenging. And we, we don't want to just play. Maybe we should play the local bar for, for every Friday night. You know, maybe we should do that. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe. Well, yeah. Maybe. I mean, hey, what well, you, you you never know what could happen. Um, uh, man, I I I feel you so much though on the whole touring thing. I I mean, do you do you enjoy touring? Because you toured live with the B fifty twos for what like almost twenty years or something. I mean, you were touring and and recording with them and writing with them. I mean, did you? I mean, and so you only you played with them what? What, until 2018 or way, way earlier than that? Was it in the... Um, I, my, I think my, uh, 2007. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. I got that way wrong. <laughs> okay, awesome. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, so you, you... I mean, were you... I, I imagine that when they did book tours, they toured pretty extensively. Is that something that you like doing? And then, I mean, and and do you think about and like thinking about that now and at your age and your you know your your health and where you're at? And I'm not trying to say anything bad. Well, I just saw, they played there. I, I saw everybody on Friday night. Yeah, man, we we they played. Okay, when we started, and this was before Love Shack was released. And there wasn't a video. Um, we were just going to play a couple weeks. Mm. They didn't even know whether people were going to like this thing or buy it. Um, and so we we rehearsed and we played. And we I think 
I know our first gig was like at a party for a magazine and then we played CBGBs and then a club in, called Toads in New Haven, Connecticut. And we played a handful of dates across the country and the crowd started to get bigger and bigger. And we flew back and did uh, the Love Shack video and went back out on the road and then the crowds got really big. Oh, okay. Wait, wait. Can can we hold on a second? So, I mean, Rock Lobster came out. So, so they already had hits, right? Like, were they well, yeah, on the decor? As, okay. they, they, as far as I was concerned, they were famous. I mean, yeah. they were... We might be friends. We were friends, uh -huh. but they were happening. Mm. You know, of course, the image and reality might be a little bit different, but they hadn't played in uh, four or five years, maybe oh, longer. Okay. It, and uh, I, I should know that exact time, but I don't. That's and right. we, um, we, you know, but we. So I love touring. Mm. Mm. I mean, you know, I had never been in a band like that. Right. And so where your people are going, and we were really good uh, and people were going nuts yeah. and they wanted to hear, and Love Shack and Rome were both in the top 10. That's awesome. So, I mean, you got to see, I have it on my website, a, a picture of what it looked like when we played um, uh, somewhere on there, or maybe it's on Facebook. You know, when we played Central Park, we played we played on that weekend, we played Central Park and there were hundreds of thousands of people there. Um, and we played Radio City Music Hall for three nights and then Saturday Night Live. Oh, wow. And it was like, this is like, you know, and it was like, do you want to go to Australia? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, let's go. Sure. And, <laughs> I mean, it was cool. It got, it got, it, a lot of people were into that band. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, so that I, I didn't realize that they took like a, a break. So I can only imagine that like coming back to, you know, two top 10 songs and, you know, tour life and stuff. So it's really cool that that was sort of like their second wind of, of their career. And they just sort of, they, and, and I would say they probably blew away what they had already accomplished. Right. In those, in those, in the eighties or like as, as you know, as love shack and stuff came away, they sort of exceeded what they've already done. Uh, right. Or am I got that wrong? I don't know. Well, you have it right, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't really necessarily, it was just, it, it's who they are. Mm-hmm. They did. I got you. I mean, those, those first records with with Rock Lobster and Planet Claire and uh, Private Idaho and um, a lot of people in my generation just loved that stuff. Yeah. And so they were we you know when when and it was a break and you know things rarely are a straight line and it's definitely not a straight line with the, with the bees, but I saw them the other night and man, they were killing and the songs are amazing. And yeah, I mean, and, and they're working really hard. You know, I was, I, I had it wrong. You know, I, I was talking to them, Kate and Fred after the show and, and, and Cindy, and it's like, I thought they were going, they were done. Mm. But no, they're going out for another month. Where are you going? Well, tomorrow we drive to Atlantic City. And then we're driving to, I don't know, Las Vegas or or maybe Atlanta. Wow. You know, it's just, it's really hard. Yeah. And they're great. They're great. They're killing it. Yeah. Man. It's a great show. Yeah, I mean, I would definitely go check that out. I mean, the B fifty twos are awesome. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, you know, full transparency. I, I was never like the hugest B fifty twos fan. I wasn't like, ah, oh, but you know, they definitely kill it. And Rock Lobster, Love Shack, Rome. I mean, all those songs are are, are awesome. And what they were doing was so different and so, uh, I mean, for at the time it was just it was just so different. Um, you know, there was this, I, I, I kind of see the trajectory it, it's, you know, like in your own career listening, it's like, you got this like twangy, almost surfy thing that you guys are doing, especially in like, you know, in the, uh, uh, the Ray beats and, and eight I spy, you know, you get, it really reminded me of like almost post-punk, you know, that kind of like, uh, straightforward rock. And then you, but you still had like that twang surfiness going on. 
um, I don't know, just remind me of like almost post punk. And then when I was looking up into it, they, they listed the B-52s as post punk. And I'm like, is that right? I don't know if Google had that right. But these names and these, they're, they're also weird. Like, like, so for instance, one of the things that I was thinking, it was like, um, I, I read on Wikipedia and you were there. So it's nice to we'll be able to confirm this, but like, they were saying that no wave was an answer to new wave, uh, because it was like a rejection of new wave. Is that true? That's what Wikipedia said. Oh, oh man. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. I mean, it was, it was, it, it started with an album as far as, uh, you know, when it became a thing, there was a record that was produced by Brian Eno oh. who had worked with the talking heads and, and, right. uh, he, you know, he was in famously a, a, an original member of Roxy Music, but he had had gone on and and done some seriously impactful productions, you know, Devo and yeah. and later, um, and so there was this record that he put out, or, or a compilation of four bands that was called No New York, with the Contortions. Uh, Teenage Jesus, the DNA, and Mars. And this record is amazing. It, it, it's not for the faint of heart. It's unlistenable. But um, it was the, these guys were my friends. I mean, I was friends with Don and George from the Contortions, uh, Don, Jody, and George, and we formed the Ray Beats. And I was. Jim Sklavunas and Lydia were in Teenage Jesus and we formed it I Spy. And um, it was loud, noisy, angry, violent, confrontational. And there was a scene, that's kind of what New York, not, not all of New York, but it was, there are others. Uh, and it was a, a scene of, of downtown, uh, New York of experimentation and wild stuff. And, and really it was like, all right, well, th let's see how far this can go. Hmm. You might say it was an answer to new wave. I, I really wouldn't quite put it that way, but it was like playing rock and roll without any of the conventional rock and roll vocabulary. Hmm. You know, this was something else altogether. Yeah. It's cool. Other bands were doing it before we were. They were uh, comes to mind like uh, the, the I would put suic a band called Suicide in there, hmm. and Glenn Branca and uh, the Theoretical Girls and other there are other groups that, that it was this wildly experimental hmm. scene. Yeah. Hmm. That, I mean, I love that, and I, I imagine that when everything was happening, you guys weren't like, "Oh man, this is gonna, this is a scene," or I, I don't know, like how when things are happening in that in the in the moment. I mean, was there a moment where you're just like, "This is something special," or, or were you just going with the momentum of the environment? Well, you know, actually, a little of both. I mean, there were a couple clubs in New York City. The Mud Club, Tier 3 comes to mind. There were places to play. We could really play. Mm -hmm. you, and they wouldn't, you know, maybe there was a little, you can't play CBGBs if you had played Max's Kansas City the week before. You had to wait a month, let's say. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, it's all we knew, you know, just playing around. And the the scene was there to support us. And so I'm still in touch with a lot of these people that they, these are my friends right. and we were there for each other, some more than others, but, and some are no longer alive, sadly, but um, I'm still, it, it, it wasn't like, Oh, this is our scene, but we knew we, it was like a tribe, mm. you know, we had each other. And it wasn't just the musicians. It was the, it, it was the people booking the clubs, whether it's Dan Satiria or Hurrah, uh, come to mind. Um, there were others. And um, it was the, the restaurant down on the corner that would give me a tab 
I didn't have to pay, you know, I could pay after I had a gig. Um, there was the, the Dell, the 24 hour diner that would give me a cigarette, free cigarettes or, or, and then I would pay them back yeah. uh, at the end of the alley. Um, you know, I mean, it, it wasn't just me. It was like a, a, a collective organism mm. and there were filmmakers, people make Amos Poe, Jim Jarmish. Um, there were writers, uh, another director betty gordon you know i i, I don't want to i'm leaving people out i know it but um we were all in like we were, we were in it together yeah. you know and we came after that first wave of bands really hit like talking heads mm -hmm. ramones blondie television they come to mind i'm probably you know but you know, th they were big stars. Mm, you know, yeah, we were we were we were just doing our thing. I mean, we would make a forty-five, and you'd go down to the bar or the diner and ask them to put it on the jukebox. And yeah, okay, and we would play it, and it was just it was like a, even though it was New York City, it was our our scene. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and New York offers itself to that right like you can have pockets of scene because at the same time the hip-hop scene is is culminating right in, in in the city so uh or at least come it, it's starting to really pop right around this time it's starting to really cross over or is it just starting it's just starting okay but let me tell you it's it was like a rocket yeah and i later went out on the road you know no who was it well it was all coming together as one painters keith herring kenny sharf jean-michel basquiat you know the, yeah. the, and jean-michel painted the he was a dj at at tier three that i mentioned earlier wow and um keith you know and the discos yeah. there was like a roller disco that was playing hip-hop music um and we were aware of it and they were coming in and you could hear a DJ play some of the early hip hop, what, you know, DJ Cool Herc. In fact, that was the, that was one of the reasons why the rabies actually formed was George, the bass player was working in a, a record store called the musical maze and guys were starting to come in. Customers were starting to come in and request these records that he didn't know 12 inches one side would be uh, a hip-hop you know uh i i can't think of who, who in the, but then on the b side would be an instrumental and it would be using a sample from like apache mm. that was a big one by the uh, amazing bongo band and um so hip-hop was in the clubs and he thought, well, oh, God, man, listen to these instrumentals that people are playing at um, the roller disco up there and disco fever up in the Bronx and whatnot. And it was like, man, we should do that. We'll be an instrumental band. <laughs> but um, KRS One. Mm. And then, of course, like a year or two later, uh, Run DMC and and, you know, Fab Five Freddy was around and he was you know there was a show called tv party and and then of course blondie famously did um rapture uh, yeah with, and name checks freddie in there and um it it's just it, it was just a magical time and i i get pretty excited when you bring up hip-hop because oh god that was like the coolest thing yeah well, I was just listening to Rick Rubin talk to somebody. It was on some podcast and Rick Rubin was talking about, you know, this same exact time and like, you know, his experience. And, uh, you know, it, it just sounds like a really magical time. But it also sounds like New York was like a really gritty and really violent place. And so it seems like it was like, I don't know, it seemed like it was like a very pressurized you know, pressure brings diamonds type of situation. You know what I mean? Like your environment was so, so wild. And, and I don't know, like, uh, what, what were, what were the drugs that were going around in the scene then? And you don't have to admit that you did any or not, but I'm just curious if you, if you were, if you noticed. 
I've never been asked that, but you oh. know, the drugs, the drugs were everywhere. Huh. And, um, you know, New York was rough and, you know, drugs were cheap hmm. enough. And then it just blew up when crack hit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And that was awful. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that was just devastating and terrible, yeah. you know, but, but, you know, I sadly either, you know, people would had died of heroin overdoses or of AIDS. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I forgot. My God, this is such an intense time in, in, in New York history. Like, is it, I mean, I mean, I would say right now is probably a pretty intense time as well, but like in the eighties, like it, 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 it had to have been such a, a, such a wild time. Like just every, the drugs, the diseases, the, the, the music, the art, the, the, the movies that were coming out. Like, it, it just seems like it was a, like a really, really interesting place to sort of create, but like dangerous, like, like it just seems like the art was dangerous too, you know? I mean, I mean, look how much people feared punk look how much people feared hip-hop you know like like the ge people were afraid of this but it was because it was being cooked up in in a pressure cooker i mean like no wonder people were like oh my god what the hell is this which yeah yeah which i mean it kicked the door down which is amazing and and thank god it did I, i'm grateful for it um, yeah, we had someone in the, in the chat asking about, uh, uh, uh about, uh, the B-52s and the Rocco theme song. Um, uh, what, were, you were in the band at the time. So did you like talk these guys into doing the theme song? Like, Hey, come over here and do the theme song. Or how did that, how did you end up, how did they end up coming into the, the song too? Well, yeah, I was in the band, um, and I was doing the cartoon at the same time, which was a, no small thing. And after the first year, we wanted to do a new theme song. And so I just asked, <laughs> yeah. you know, sure. The, awesome. and, and we did other ones. We worked on a, a cartoon together uh, called... Um, Oh God, what's the name of that? The Groovinians for the Cartoon Network. It only lasted a year, but the music is phenomenal. Kate, Fred and Cindy, we did a theme song. We did about five other songs. That, that was fun. Oh, that's really so fun. I, I love that you guys were like, that they were into it too. Like it, it wasn't just like, hey, will you do me this favor? But it was like, oh my gosh, this is a fun project. Let's go have fun. And like, that's beautiful. I, I love that. Yeah. Uh, well, it, it it's so different than making records, you know. Um, you just you just go dare to be stupid uh, and have fun. I mean, if it's a job, but yeah, I, you know, if I'm gonna work with somebody, I might as well work with my friends that I'm in a band with. Yeah, um, I'm trying to think what else we did. I think Kate and I did a couple things. Uh, Fred and I did a theme song for Trekkies uh, movie um a documentary on star trek fans you know we we, we did a bunch of different things oh, that's um, and we could do them tomorrow too you know i mean yeah. fred asked me if i felt like doing anything and it was sure yeah <laughs> sure uh, i love that i love that you, you you feel like doing anything yeah okay all right is that uh, that yeah, sounds like... well, come on man that's what you do right exactly exactly i feel you it's uh, um it's it just it's really endearing to hear you you know just like two old friends like hey we should you know play together and have fun you know it's like that's just it's nice it's just a very endearing sentiment um did you leave the b-52s to work on another project um it was time for a change mm. um and and that's the best way to put it. Uh, I couldn't have stayed in the band and worked on Nurse Jackie and Bored to Death. Mm. Uh, so, and I don't remember if I was specifically um, to, that I was going to work on another project, but they were also specifically starting to record and they wanted to kind of go about it in a different way and kind of 
instead of get bigger, it gets a little bit smaller. And they, we just, it was time for a change. Yeah. No, it just, that's just how it is. I mean, are, are you someone that, that listens to instinct? Are you someone that listens to, I mean, cause like, that's a pretty big decision. I mean, you leave a successful band to, you know, go do other things. Um, <clears throat> what, what, was that was that a hard decision or were you just like this just needs to change i mean like how do you do you do you operate off instinct or was this something you really thought out and 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 is that how you approach most things well it 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 wasn't all my decision ah gotcha. um but uh and it was difficult there was a heartbreaking side of it because you know i it wasn't only playing in a band it was like these guys, this was these this was a 17 year, 18 year, 20, I don't know, long run of crew, sound men, wardrobe, people on the road, you know, like you, you know, like you 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 go you tour for 18 years, you you see the same people every summer at a venue. And but it was mostly I missed the, I missed the hang. Yeah. You know, I missed, I missed, I missed it. And it, and I, and I, and I've never done anything like it since. I'll tell you that, mm. you know, a, a, a stadium full of people singing back the lyrics to a song, you know, that, that is crazy, you know, that they know it and their kids know it. And, you know, I've never, that was a one in some lifetime thing. Yeah. yeah. And so there was a heartbreaking side to it too. Uh, like, shit this is gonna end uh, this is done um and we had done some really cool things together yeah. but i don't have any anything bad to say oh, about yeah. that about it i mean it was it was it was deep yeah man well i mean that's a long time to be committed to a project that's like that and you know that it's a lot of t man cuz when you're on the road it's like you're in the trenches man and i know it's not that serious where 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 you're at war but you're going to battle every day you know what i mean i don't know like the way that's how i looked at it. i looked at it like these are my brothers in arms brothers and sisters in arms and you just create this it creates this like just this bond that you could just never get past and and well, unless you hate the other person but you know well, luckily for me i've never had to tour with people that i absolutely hate so that's good but you know i i i i absolutely love that part of of going on the road with your band and that kind of camaraderie that that creates because there's one thing to record an album together and play shows together but like you don't really I feel like you don't really know no people until you're on the road and traveling and they hit a situation that's really hard to handle. <laughs> and then you really see what people are Let's made of. Back. Let's just face it, you know, you're not always at your best. <laughs> no, no, you're not. So well, you, you know, there there are times when um and you, you gotta work at it, you know, because you know that okay, well, oh, you're not at your best tonight man what i'm still gonna wake up and see everybody tomorrow and <laughs> yeah. you know you 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 either want to be the person people want to talk to or not and sometimes uh -huh. you don't feel like talking to anybody yeah. it you know it's a it's 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 a grind it's cool yeah. but everybody was it you, you know it, it, listen at this they're, they're at it for 45 years so we're talking about professionals oh yeah they, they've done this before yeah. but they've done it in a very unique way hmm. this is not a conventional rock band Ah, what, and it, it, and do you got any go example? Ahead. I'm sorry. Do you got any examples of what you mean by that? That they're unique. Um, that it's. Could you sort well, of the sound? Well, yeah, yeah, the sound. But like, because you said that they haven't done it the traditional way. They've done you know different ways. Is it because of how unique the sound is, or was it? Were they doing different things in the back end, like in the business side? What was it? Well, let's just take, you know, your idea of what a band should look like. Mm. Yeah. You know, a rock group, you know, like this is not Def Leppard. <laughs> no, it's not. And I like Def Leppard. Me too. I do too. But, but um, yeah, you're right. It's totally different. Or, you know, and there are other bands that don't, you know, like don't look like a conventional band gotcha. but you know when you saw that first cover with kate and cindy with wigs fred with a drawn-in mustache and they're not they're not playing halloween you know right. this is not like get up this is who they are 
that's what i mean yeah okay i get what you're saying i get what you're saying that that's uh uh, I'm actually looking for that picture because I want to see that. The, you said that's from their first album that that you're talking about, the, the Yellow Record. Yeah, let me see yeah. if I can get an up close picture of it so people can see it. Um, I don't know if I'm gonna do this stupid thing. I, I mean, know. you know, like you, 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 it's, it's, it just wasn't a band that people were <sighs> used to seeing. Um. Sorry, there we go. Yeah, that's it. There you go. This is terrible. No, you can't see anything on this, but uh, maybe we could do this. Oops. All right, there we go. It's a little bigger, y'all. But I, oh, it's all like pixelated and crappy. There you go, guys. Here's a pixelated, crappy picture. Look at it. Um, they, can, they can look it up. I mean, yeah, yeah. Know, Google it yourself, you lazies. And so, you know, the, the songs are like, you've got a song that's kind of a hit called rock lobster um yeah where's the chorus what what what's the uh, well that's kind of an intro <laughs> or there's this song called planet claire or there you know strobe light it, it, it they're not singing like uh uh living on a prayer yeah. it, 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 or like bon jo it's just a different kind of song you're absolutely right and when i saw them for the first time and i I saw some very early gigs. I knew I wanted to be in this band. You know, I for me they had it all. Yeah. It was like the perfect per, perfect combination of like the Shangri Las or or like a the girl a girl group, um, the Ventures, a, like a surf thing, the, the Stooges, which was my idea of like a perfect rock and roll band, um, Iggy and the Stooges. Yeah. Amazing. They just, it was utterly unique. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that. I mean, and, and the Farisfa sound too, like that just. Yeah, yeah the organ, Farfisa, yeah. and Farfisa, Kate Farfisa, yeah. I, I always call that f something stupid. I always call it Farfisa or for for what I don't even know what I just said, but you knew what I was talking about. Thank oh, God, yeah. because I just sound like a jackass. You can, you can just let that go. Yeah, but we'll it, move right um, back. But, uh, you know, it was a, it was a, it was a fantastic sound. Yeah, um, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and then, and then as you became more a part of the band and you, you started writing material with them, right? Like you were, you were creating songs, writing songs with them or was it, how did that no, work? I never, I never was a, uh, they have a very idiosyncratic way of writing mm. um, and they kept that to themselves and then would share it with us at a certain time and bring us in. Okay. Um, we did that with uh, good stuff and, and live, we all contributed to the sound, mm -hmm. but the core sound is, was the band was uh, Kate, Keith, Fred and Cindy. Um, uh, and of course, in the very beginning, Ricky Wilson. Oh, he passed, right? He, he ended up passing. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And that was that, the, therefore the break that we were, we were ah. with. There we go. There we go. That explains it. And so, um, but no, um, but you, you know, I, 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 they made us feel very welcome. Hmm. It wasn't like, uh, but it was clear there was a line, you know, that, that they were the original members of the band and they would, they would write in their way and they, they kind of write. It's very personal. It's not like, okay, I have this cool chorus. It's more like they jam and they collage ideas together. And it's it's totally unique. Well, I, I mean, it has to be, right? It has to be for it to, the outcome to be as unique as they are. So that's, I, yeah, I can only imagine. We've got another question from the chat and it kind of goes in line with another. And Morby, I hope you're still awake. I'm so sorry. Morby asked this question 40 minutes ago. Uh, but uh, we'll just tie these two questions together because it's uh, why not? Uh, so the uh, super feisty Fox is asking, uh, how did it feel to return to the Rocco movie? And then more. Oh, Morby's here. Thank you, Morby. And then um, did it feel like old times again or did the vibe change? And that's sort of piggybacking the questions there. Good. Cool. <laughs> it was so much fun. I got the band back together. <laughs> the old adage. I love it. Oh, it's beautiful. And, and so the band got back together oh. and, at the, and it was like, we didn't lose a step. Wow. Everyone was there. 
and uh, we played and we did it and it was so much fun. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the musicians were really, we had a great run together, you know, with, with, with the original cartoon. Mm -hmm. And so everybody was just really happy to see one another. Oh, nice. And uh, the vibe was fantastic. And I love the movie. I've never seen the movie. That's so interesting. I've never seen the movie. Oh man, they've I... been lost. They 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 they've been lost in outer space. Oh, since since the original cartoon. Oh. So they came back to Earth. They got cell phones. People are taking <laughs> selfies. Okay, okay. Starbucks, the internet, <laughs> internet porn. It's like, <laughs> it's like a complete thing. It's everything's different. Yeah, and uh. And and then the storyline is is pretty far out. Mr. and Mrs. Big Head, I don't know if you remember them. They're the next door neighbors. Yes, I do. Ah oh, man, they, they need to find their son. Ralph is lost, so it's Rocco's job to go around the world to try to find Ralph. And they find Ralph in the desert. He's he's selling. He, he's got an ice cream truck, and he's uh, selling ice cream in the desert. Yeah, but. <laughs> He's no longer Ralph, and it was it's one of the all time coolest moments in anything I've ever worked on. And they're so excited, Rocco. They find him in the desert in sort of this Lawrence of Arabia kind of thing, where the ice cream truck is coming down, like Lawrence, and and um, and they're trying to get Ro Ro Rocco, uh, excuse me, Ralph, to come out, uh, and he goes. And, and this deep voice goes, I'm not Ralph anymore. And one foot comes out and it's a, it's a high heel. And I'm going to give it away, but it's basically, I'm not Ralph anymore. I'm Rachel. Oh, he, he transitioned. He transitioned. Nice. That is, yeah, yeah. It's very, very modern, very modern yeah. life. Rocco's modern life. Yeah, totally. <laughs> very now. That that that's fun. Uh, I, I'll still watch it though. I'll still watch the movie because now I'm just like, oh, when did this come out? When this sounds so recent. Like when was this? Uh, I, I, 2019, I think. Oh my, oh my god! <laughs> it was not that long ago. Oh, I know what happened. The the world turned in upside down and inside out. That's that's what happened. That's why. Exactly. Like that. uh, how was that for you, by the way? How was the pandemic? Uh, I know I talked to people throughout the whole pandemic, and I either had, I am at my peak creativity right now, or I am drinking myself to sleep every day. <laughs> <laughs> and watching TV. Yeah. What? Well, it was a little of both. Hey, hey, we all had our moments. We all had our moments. I, I smoked yeah. way too much pot. Way too much. Way too much. But hey, <laughs> we if we come out on the other end. We're stronger for it. Um, yeah. But how was it for you? Like what? What? Uh, I, well, I, I, you know, Rock. Uh, excuse me. Dexter was all done through done through the whole pandemic, mm -hmm. and they had to. Um, you know, they were chasing the weather. Uh, they were chasing COVID and the lockdown. They had they had some real obstacles to make that series work in, in, in the location they were in and pull it off in post-production with the editors and the um, really the acting, the, the weather. You know, it was supposed to be in cold upstate New York. And then all of a sudden it's there's no snow anymore. You know, it all melted. 90 and, degrees. <laughs> where did it go? You know, they figure it out and pretend to be cold. And um, uh, so I had to do all of my work through all of that. Mm. Mm. And then Sus, Sus made record a record through all of that as well. All right. And we also made a movie. We shot a movie. We thought, well, instead of people were doing these live stream concerts, and we had a record come out in the middle of it called Promise. And um, we thought, oh, well, shoot, we don't really want to live stream. We'll, uh, we'll make a movie. And so we, a very generous um, space in my neighborhood, uh, a gallery space in my neighborhood in New York, uh, in, in Queens, they donated the space for us, um, the studio. And we just set up and we shot a movie. 
I mean, it's not, I don't know where you can find it, but we did it. <laughs> that's, that's what I'm trying to find. I'm like, where is this? Movie? What's the movie called? Uh, Promise Live. I think maybe on Bandcamp you can find it. Oh, yeah. Promise Live right here. Oh, my gosh. I don't know if you can see the real movie. Maybe we have to stream it again. But but we made a movie. Um, and um, that's what we did. Yeah. And uh, if anybody is interested in this, uh, please check out. Go ahead in the chat and get yourself some. Um, and I also put Pat's. Uh, where is your? I just had it. I'll put. Uh, we'll put Pat's uh, website in too, guys. So make sure you guys are are going and following Pat. And make sure you're staying up to date with Pat here. Oh my. Okay. All right here we go. And uh, if you're listening on the audio end, you guys go in the show notes. Make sure you're clicking on the the links and make sure you're supporting Pat through all he's doing. We got we, we got to get Pat going here. We got to give him the, the the we speak English good bump. So let's do it, folks. Uh, give Pat some love. All right, let me see here. Um, I I don't I I started like doing something on the internet, like I was actually doing something. But really, I should be like, okay, next question. <laughs> And I don't know what exactly I was trying to do, but that's just, this is the outcome of smoking too much pot during uh, the pandemic. Yeah. This is, this is, this is the outcome. Burnout central. Um, I've always wondered how, how people, uh, well, how composers sort of, um, will compose to a scene. Um, you know, I, I know there's various different ways to approach it, but I'm just really curious. How do you, how do you approach a scene? So like if someone gives you a scene, let's say they just give you a scene and it's just the scene and they give you no notes on like, Oh, it has to be dark and ethereal. It's just, boom. It's just a scene and it's Pat and we got to go. We got deadlines. Uh, well, you got to do what you got to do. <laughs> Great answer. Gotta, gotta figure it out. <laughs> well, but, but what would you say? Sort of different. Like, um, I was, I'm thinking about a scene in a show that I call did called The Good Cop. And there it was starring Tony Danza and Josh Groban. And the guy who created it made a created a show called Monk. Oh yeah. And Monk was a really good show. Yeah, I remember that. And Andy Breckman. And um so I get this do this i'm doing it and they sent me a scene exactly like that and you know i had to look at it quickly on my feet it was a cop show i love 70s cop music like bullet or um that movie comes to mind or jeff you know, I love henry mancini i love crime oh. jazz ah yes yes i get what you're saying not 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 70s not 70s stuff you did like the funk stuff but you're talking about the jazz stuff. yeah yes that 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 mystery jazz or whatever you call it. What, yeah. what did you just call it you call it crime jazz yeah we're going with it crime jazz <laughs> i right. love it i mean and i really i thought okay and then and then i look at the the place i look at the uh you know, in the case of Dexter, we were in upstate New York. It was cold. It was isolated. It was uh, austere. And we just, I needed to find a way to get the music into that place. Mm -hmm. The same way a, a costume designer would make the costumes or lighting or, you know, a, a specific time, you know. Um, Dexter, you know, we, we, it, it was contemporary, yet we were using themes. So the very first, it was the same thing. Yeah, I had to do something. The very first episode where uh, his son, we don't know who it is, but this shadowy figure is kind of stalking Dexter and they wanted some music for that right away. Mm -hmm. And I just went for it. I just thought, okay, um, I knew the character. I knew, and and then you you want to stay well, depending on the type of project. But you want to let the actors act. You you don't want to like do your thing all over it. You don't want to, you know. And it's different for a cartoon, maybe yeah. definitely different. But um, 
you want to be a part of the storytelling you want to enhance the place and you can do you know and i'm i'm not a real conventional hollywood type composer so my go-to thing is not like an orchestral sound i love that stuff but that's not who i am um i'll kind of look at it from a different angle and uh you 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 just find what works and you know you hopefully you hit it but sometimes you don't <laughs> and you've got to be ready for that it's like yeah. well um and uh that's not what i had in mind oh you mean it's a funny scene <laughs> well, i didn't know that <laughs> oh, or, or the opposite it's serious you know wow. um or you know we want to make the you know the, you you feel the texture mm. of it and you 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 you're you're part of that that that's that's an interesting thing to think about where you might compose a supposedly funny scene but you compose it as like a very serious thing that misinterpretation to me that just tells me how much like film and tv are 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 colored by the music which i mean i already knew that but like still it's like a very um if 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 the music is what's cueing that this is like a you know supposed to be a funny scene you know that that that's that, that's just interesting to me that it's not obvious sometimes it's not obvious but 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 you know who's really good at let's just take fargo mm. where it's a kind of a funny scene but the music is super serious yeah okay um and it makes it funnier right right oh. that composer Peter burwell is really good at that and 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 that was the thing about um, Dexter is that here he is. This is a really bad guy. He's a serial killer. Right. Um, but there were mo comic moments. There were moments of levity. And it was the same in Nurse Jackie where, you know, she had very questionable ethics and morals. She's a drug addict. Yeah. Most drug addicts do. <laughs> and there was that. And, and, and so... And there were comic moments mm. that we had to, had to find, and that that's that's pretty tricky. Yeah, but yeah, I can imagine, man. And like, uh, that's really. Is there like a first time someone put like you know it, it, that you can think of in the history of cinema or TV where they they where it worked, where there was a scene that was supposed to be, uh, uh you know, maybe supposed to be. Uh, it's supposed to be serious connotation, but you know, like the 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 music is wrong or something. You know, like the music is silly. Like you, it's just the wrong. You know, like what we would think is the wrong uh, pairing. You know, what I mean, like like for instance, um, it, uh, uh, Reservoir Dogs, right? Um, it, the Quentin Tarantino movie. Uh, it, it has that scene where uh, I think his name is Mr. Black or whatever his name is. He's doing a dance to Bob Dylan. And he's dancing while he's about to cut some dude's ear off. Now, those musical pairings, in my mind, that doesn't that doesn't make sense, right? But it adds so much to the scene, and it shows how crazy and and disconnected this guy from humanity, this this Mr. Black is, and he's about to just torture this guy and then light him on fire. Um, You're talking about the song "Stuck in the Middle with You." Yeah, with, I stuck. Think it's Jerry Rafferty, I believe. Oh, okay. That wasn't Bob Dylan. Oh, my bad. Oh, jeez. That's all right. I love it. I love it. I'm on today, boy. I was gonna let you go, but, I, <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, the song is stuck in the middle with you. I mean, that's a great example. But you know, I'm thinking. You know, you asked me about his in cinema. I I'll go all the way back to silent film. Oh. Um, City Lights. Okay. Um, you know, or you know, beautiful movies. I mean, I think it's been done. A, a lot where there's you know uh, a comic moment is sort of uh underscored with serious music yeah over inflated right right so make it too important so 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 this has been a device since the beginning then well i i i i, I guess <laughs> I so, yeah. no i mean just because i mean like it, that I just there's something interesting about like the the mispairing of 
you know uh emotions that that just to me is just yay i i don't know i it's hard for me to even explain where i'm coming from but it, it's just that i guess we'll just leave it there um would you say that in animation music has more control about the scene versus non-animated tv and films could you repeat that? Sure, sure. This is a question. And hi, Ziggy. I, I hope you're doing okay. Good morning. I hope I hope everything's going well for you. Uh, would you say that in animation music, or I'm sorry, would you say that in animation music has more control of the scene versus non-animated uh, TV and film? In the, it, it, I mean, it's not all the same. But let's just take like Bugs Bunny or or Rocco. Um, you know, which is different than Bojack Horseman or uh, Beavis and Butthead or Rick and Morty. You know, it, it's all a little different. But in the in in animation, you can you you can get closer to the picture. Hmm. And so, you know, uh, like I would get direction from Joe Murray and Rocco if like Rocco was going up the stairs, he would say, you know, let's climb the ladder of anxiety or something like that, you know, and the music, you know, the, the character would walk up the stairs. Right. You don't really want to do that in a movie. Yeah. <laughs> Unless you're being silly, right? Unless you're being super silly. <laughs> Imagine that's in a murder mystery. <laughs> yeah, well, it may, maybe it is, and I'm sure it is somewhere. I mean, there's a lot of amazing music. Yeah, yeah but, um, for sure. In the cartoon, you can get really close to the picture. Ah, that makes sense. And that's, that's a, a real term. It was from Mickey Mouse cartoons, and they call it Mickey Mousing. Oh, wow. So, you know, like, you know, you know, if if the character is screaming and the music Wah! or you know the the famous themes that were introduced in warner brothers cartoons with by raymond scott you know dun, 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 powerhouse and the and or let's take fantasia mm. like with a with a with a that amazing scene where the the water and the, it, it, it you can get really close to the picture yeah um I don't know if that answers this question very well, but I think I think so. Z Ziggy, did that is that does that suffice, Ziggy? <laughs> Ziggy's probably still wiping the the sleep out of her eyes. So, <laughs> but I appreciate you being Where here. Where is Ziggy? Ziggy is in South Korea. Awesome. Yeah, we got people from all over the world in here. So. Oh, I love that. Yeah, me too. I I love this platform. I, have you ever heard of Twitch? I've heard of it. Yeah. Yeah. Have, have you ever done anything with it? No, this is my first time. Oh, cool, cool. Yeah, it's a cool little platform. I mean, you know, for for it's just live streaming. Started out as a gamer um, for gamers, and now there's musicians on here. I mean, some world class musicians on here who are doing really amazing things. I mean, with this platform, it's cool because uh, the people, the musicians on this platform. Um, they they'll use very high end microphones and they have really nice equipment. So when they're playing, it, it's not like at a bar, right? Where you ha where where the sound is has to fight with bodies and it has to fight with the TV and the game oh, yeah, and people yeah, yeah. talking. Okay. It's very intimate and you can put a lot of time and effort into making your sound and the visual quality excellent because they have that capability of you know streaming you know high bitrate or whatever you want to call it so to me it's really really interesting to see how people are utilizing this this uh this platform um coming from the working musician sam i hope one day we will see more rocco but the movie was great treat <laughs> any more rocco coming pat any inside information no they, they they did that um, I was trying to make an interview since I grew up watching Pepper Ann. Oh, yeah. Didn't you? You composed for Pepper Ann, too, right? Yes, I did. There you go, Ziggy. Uh, Pat was on Pepper Ann. Um, uh, I was trying to make an uh, make the interviews. Oh, oh okay. That's what um, I, I was like. Make an interview when you're going to make it like bake a cake. You're going to bake a <laughs> See, see too much pot, kids. Stay, drugs are bad. Don't do drugs. Except for Naders. Naders can do all the pot he wants. Uh, okay. Uh, but I, I, I really, really enjoy your, your, um, 
your project was sus and i would love to talk a little bit more about that uh what 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 made you want to start a band like that i mean because like you guys play out like we were talking about you guys play out um i imagine you know it, it, it's certain it, it draws ambient type music definitely uh uh it, it draws a certain type of person right um so i don't know how are what made you want to get into doing that and then what made you want to take it live well we were friends who uh, it was one guy who lived in my neighborhood um and he was friends with a couple other guys who had all played together back in the late 70s early 80s but i i hadn't played with them they're from uh bought they played they're from providence Oh, what I and then they moved up to Boston and they um, and we they were in a band called um, Rubber Rodeo. And I um, and we were meeting up at a deli like old school restaurant on Fifth Avenue called Eisenstein's um, and we would meet and we would. You know, get masa ball soup and French fries. That's what I like to eat, and um, not bad. Um, and it's the best. And you go in there; it's real old school. People yelling, "No Coke, no Coke, Pepsi!" It's like the Saturday Night Live skit, and it's still there. And um, we would hang out, and at a certain point, one of the members suggests talk, and we're all. I mean, we all had this kind of ambient music in common comment from slightly different directions but touchstones that we all really liked whether it would be rye cooter in the paris texas or mm. soundtrack or craft work or eno frip and eno you know we had things and it was like what would happen if eno worked with enio morricone so eno meets enio and we we just started we we came over to my studio and we made the first record mm. we just started to play we kind of knew what we wanted to do and um and and then take it from there and playing live was really not an idea not nobody thought thought we were ever it didn't even occur to us and but we got small record label called northern spy has been wonderfully supportive and they made it really clear like you guys got to play live and they really helped us and so the first gig we did was down in a theater and the, on the ground floor of of my studio building and then we played at a uh, a couple places in brooklyn and uh then we played like the mercury lounge uh, we played up in Providence and Boston and, you know, we started to play a little bit and then we made another record and it just unfolded. Mm. And for guys at, at, at our age, if you, you know, not, there aren't a lot of ambient bands, <laughs> no. but, no. but there, but there are, you know, but there aren't, there aren't, but I just saw a fantastic concert like at a, in up, uh, Uptown, Upper Fifth Avenue in in New York City, with with uh, Chuck Johnson, who who played pedal steel. Uh, he's got a gr great record out, um, and he had a couple of musicians in his band that I that I know that I've worked with. Um, and then also on the bill was Sarah Devachi, and um, she was fantastic. And it's just kind of this community of people playing this ambient music it's very unconventional yeah uh beautiful but it's been around for quite a while oh of course of course but i i um it's just like you said that there's not a lot there is and there's not and there's it's just and it's a type of music it takes a certain type of person that actually likes it you know and actually can just yeah. you know, groove to it um uh, but I, i'm curious how do you guys go into writing like music for that like what is it is it a lot of improvisation like what what what's going on like i just i'm just curious there's a lot of improvisation mm. um 
but you know it's it's there's a structure often a structure um the way we started on our first record we don't really necessarily work that way anymore the first record uh called ghost box we definitely put that together playing just me starting to play something on a guitar and then people joining in and then it started to get to be things where we together or separately we would start to share ideas on files via the internet with one another oh okay bring that in and we'll play over it and that that started to be the case mm. uh, and so we're we're and now we're down to three members and we're um still kind of just sharing ideas and trying new things mm. it's it's awesome <laughs> yeah it, you, you, you're you playing you get to play you literally just get to play yeah. around you just fuck around. yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. and it's cool it's like you know nobody gets hurt <laughs> and uh <laughs> Very safe for everyone, folks. Fun for the whole family, friends. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I I love it. Um, we have a I I, I my uh, one of the community members here named Naders. He's a big fan of Leland Sklar. So anytime we have any uh, 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 top echelon players in here, we always got to ask: Have you ever have you ever encountered or played with Leland Sklar, the bassist? He was in the band of one of the first concerts I ever saw as a in high school. Okay. All right. And yes, I have encountered him several times through the years. Yeah. Well, we never played together. Were were they good encounters? How were oh, yeah. they? Yeah. I mean come on. The first well the first one was James Taylor. Oh sick. Um and, and he was in the band with Russ Kunkel and Danny Korchmar. And um and I think uh, that was one of the first concerts I ever saw. I know it wasn't the first, but I, I, I can remember the concert. And um, and then I, I saw him. He might have been, you know, just when you play in, in, on tour, like with the with the B-52s, where, where, where it's like tour, tour on a pretty high level, you run into other bands. Yeah. And I'm yeah. not really remembering exactly whose band he was in. Hmm. Um, but it was more than once and i'm thinking possibly um phil collins or something pardon me was it phil collins no hmm. but uh i'm thinking maybe it could have been um john fogarty who hmm. was in um credence i think maybe he was playing in that band hmm. for a second i've i've forgotten but yeah no i mean my goodness and he played in a really unique way that was very inspiring. Yeah. Yeah, no, he he's definitely he's definitely loved over here. Um <laughs> the yeah, Nader's is going nuts. He he likes that. Uh, <laughs> oh man, I I had a question and then I interrupted my own thought process and and now it's gone. It dissipated into the ether, uh which is great, which is wonderful. I I love that when that happens. Uh no, the the Leland Scar thing though, like we've heard some odd stories of him and just he's not that he's a bad guy or anything but we just heard different uh amalgamations of he, he could be a little bit uh eccentric and such but uh yeah but fantastic player and just uh, yeah yeah uh, amazing do you do studio work are you do you do any like hired gun type stuff like you 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 just mostly do the composing and writing yeah, i'm not good enough you got to be really good to do that <laughs> wait wait <laughs> As a multi instrumentalist, do you feel like uh, do you feel like I'm a multi instrumentalist, and this is how I feel, and then we'll see how you feel if you can agree with that. Do you feel like that um, you'll never be like great at one single instrument, but that you can, but you you could do pretty good, cool things with you know different instruments. I, I don't know if I'm phrasing that right. Like for me, I just don't ever see myself being like the guitar virtuoso that I thought I was going to be when I was, you know, in high school. I've sort of given up on that and just, you know, now I, I write a lot and, and, and you know, I, I'll play keys and stuff for different bands. But I've been moving away from that as this podcast has been sort of taking over and, and getting bigger. So um, 
which is kind of a sad thing, but I, I still make music as well. But but do you um do you uh do you agree with that? Is that something that you would agree with that you know things suffer when you're when you're spread thin, or or do you feel like that you have a really good grasp over one instrument over the other? I'm sorry if this question doesn't isn't coming out great, but uh, it, um, let, me, let me just see jump in and say, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. I mean, like it, when I started to record with Rocco, I was playing clarinet. Um, that was the first instrument I ever really learned to play. I played about two episodes. I was slowing everything down. I don't play every day. You know, I was good enough to, and then I started to not be good enough. And it became clear I needed to hire somebody who was really good. And I did. And he could play anything I wrote. And so he made me a better writer. Mm. Nice. And the musicians that played on that, on the Rocco, I'm playing guitar. Uh, so I'm not going to include myself, but the the musicians other musicians, I would call them virtuosos and masters. Mm. And as long as I treated them with respect, which meant that, you know, everything was on time and the music looked good and it was fun. Well, then we're okay. Yeah. Um, and, and I could write my guitar. I could play what I had to play on guitar and I'm pretty good, mm. but I'm not, you know, I'm not a mass virtuoso, but I don't think it's holding me back. Right. Well, obviously, I practice every day. I'd like to be better. Hmm. Why? What? What? What stops you from for practicing every day and getting better? No, I do practice every day. Oh, you do practice every day. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you said I don't practice every day. My bad. Uh, well, no, I don't. I don't. I don't. Well, that's actually not true. That's not true. I don't sit down and play. Uh, you know, you know, lately I've been trying to teach myself some piano pieces uh, that I should know like that, mm. but I don't. Now, if I was a if I was a real slick piano player, I would have learned that those Bach inventions in high school right. and uh, or before. And I'm I'm still trying to learn them. It doesn't hold me back. No, I, I know who I know what I can do and can't do. Right. And, and that's the important part, right? Like, you know, your limitations and like, uh, well, I know I can't do this crazy thing I'm thinking. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and hire this guy because I know he can in one yeah, take yeah. <laughs> in yeah. one take. Uh, yeah, man, I, I that's uh, I, I I operate the same way. It's like I, I know my limitations as a player and uh there's there's no reason for me to sit there and waste time trying to hit something that I know I'm not going to hit. So like bring in the big guns, y'all. <laughs> um, yeah. From scoring TV and film to playing live, what's next for you? Anything currently in the works? Oh, look at Ziggy well, doing my job. I mean, Sus, Sus is, a, is a new record coming yes. out. Er, um, early yeah, November, no y'all. Let me get yeah. some sus. And here. that's that's the main one. You guys got an Instagram sus? On Instagram, yeah. Okay. Let me let me pull, let me drop a, some sus Instagram stuff. Sus is on Instagram too. Uh, I don't know if we've kept the page up. I should go look at it. But... Do you guys got a, a web page? Something I yeah. can just drop. Sus band. If you just if it's susband, I think, dot com. Perfect. Right here. All right, guys. Make sure you guys are, are doing it. So early November, y'all got something new coming out. Well, it's really soon. Yes. And the Dexter soundtrack is coming out October 28th on Lakeshore Records. Oh, nice, nice. So, yeah, if you guys are interested in the Dexter stuff, too, make sure that you guys go and check that out. And, again, I'm going to drop Pat's uh, um, website in here so y'all can make sure you're staying up to date with Pat and what he's up to because – Cause he's awesome. Right. Um, so, so you do have, you got that coming out. You got, uh, you got Dexter, you got Su uh, Sus's new album in early November. And then um, anything else you could think of that, that you want to work on or. Well, I'd love to, but I haven't uh, 
you know, this is keeping me busy right now. I'm, I'm, I'm sure. okay. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. It, with Dexter, was that just a one season thing they did or were they planning on doing, bringing it back over and over again? And that's a bit of a mystery. We'll have to see. <laughs> I see. And when did that come out? When did the Dexter come out? It was uh, at the end of 2021 uh, oh. and for the first part of this year. Okay. And then I, 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 I lost touch. And, I love Dexter, by the way. It was a great show. And then for me personally, it kind of fell apart towards moving on in the show. I'm not trying to shit talk anybody, but it's just personal preference, whatever. Uh, in any case, the <laughs> so I lost touch with how things sort of ended and I sort of just like read how it ended. Um, did they end? The, yeah, I, I'm just, yeah, I'm, I, I, I give up. I quit. Well, no, it, it, I think that's one of the reasons why they brought it back. It's a lot of people were unhappy with the right, ending. Right. I, and, that, that, um, please. and then, you know, they tried to make it, a, you know, give it a, another kick Yeah. with, uh, and make it a real story. And I know that Michael C. Hall, the lead, he didn't, he wasn't interested in he could, unless he could really get behind the scripts mm. and the story. And he did. Yeah. And you can tell, well, um, I you mean, know, he had unfinished work to do and they, they went about and they did it. Yeah. I mean, like I could tell that he had, he was pretty hands on, especially if he's talking to you about how the music or talking to you about the music, right? Like, yeah. actors who are just actors on a production don't just be like this is how the music you know like they're not telling the musicians and stuff what's going on they're doing their job and they're going home or but uh yeah so he he, he was he a producer on the show or something yeah okay. he was one of the four producers cool that that's awesome i i love that i love that when shows sort of take it you know that they they sort of start evolving into the player the actors and and people sort of start getting involved in in the creation of the stories and stuff i that, i mean that's what i loved about the office i don't know if you're a fan of the office but i am um british and american they're both uh genius but you know like that's that's what i really liked about the office too is it just sort of had that vibe um pat you you've sat here with us for so long and you've given us so much time i i am so honored and 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 just grateful for your time and, and your effort and your energy um as as we end this conversation is there anything that you'd like to impart on us before you say goodbye no. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Everybody, make sure that you're following Pat and make sure that you are on top of the new Sus release, which is coming out early November. And of course, Dexter New Blood, the soundtrack's coming out the 28th. So make sure that you guys are going and 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 supporting and uh and staying and keeping on top of what pat is doing because pat like i feel like you could do anything at any time that like that's what i'm getting like like at any time pat could just be like and you know what i'm gonna just start doing i'm gonna start a, a hard rock band or a metal band like i almost feel like you could be a me what, how do you feel about metal are you a metal head uh no i'm not a metal head <laughs> but i do like metal well, I mean, I guess Death Leopard that that counts, right? But uh, uh, were were you? I in love Death Leopard. We did a B fifty two played on a bill with Death Leopard. Um, <laughs> that is such a weird pairing, but I love it. Yeah, it was good. Um, I, yeah, I like ACDC. I like. Oh, yeah. You know, I I don't I I mean you know Slayer. Yeah. Man. Yeah. And I remember um, I remember one of the bus drivers for uh for the b-52s you know you get really pretty close to everybody and he was moving on after a big tour he go, and he was driving pantera and i think kate and i went to go see pantera uh pantera you know yeah i mean i'll i'll check it out but it's not my go-to uh right thing yeah, me neither. Like, you know, I will listen. I, I, there was a time in my teenage years where I was just like, ah, you know, I'm which teenage boys, right? But uh, yeah, as I get older, it's just like, I like Pantera at a distance, at a reasonable level. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. All right. Ziggy and Korea has one more question, and, um, uh, and then we'll let you go. Would Pat and Susband be keen to try Twitch? I don't know. I don't know. Um, uh, well, I'll look into it because I don't know what's going on with it. But let me write it down and um, and we'll 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 look into it. 
hey man like uh and and you know, uh, for whatever it's worth, if you ever have any questions on it, let you can always reach out to me. I, I know uh, getting started is, is kind of a challenge. There's a learning curve because it does take, you know, some computing power and, and stuff like that. But if you guys do go that take it to that step, I mean, I'm more than happy to help you in any way I can. But uh, yeah, oh, I love that. thank you. I would love I would love to see Sus Bambi on Twitch. Uh, I think you guys could do amazing things, especially like I said, you you can really focus in on on the on the ambiance, and you can really focus in on on just you know making a really beautiful full sound through the computer, and you guys don't even have to leave New York City. Um, but yeah, in any case, Pat, thank you so much. I appreciate your time and you have a wonderful rest of your day. Everybody put your hands together for our amazing guest. Pat! Oh, sorry. Erwin. <laughs> All right, Pat. I'll see you later, buddy. Take care. All right, thank you. Bye. <laughs> Keep in touch. All right, bye. There we go. Pat Irwin, everybody, a fucking legend, a fucking legend. How fucking cool was that? We get, to, I mean, we got to like really talk to somebody who was like in those moments of at the birth of hip hop, at the birth of, of new wave, at the birth, I mean, at the punk rock. I mean, like this dude has been, a, been in it. And then on top of that, 